And thank you for everyone for joining today. And I hope you share my excitement about the transformation that's going to occur with digital assets in the near future. These are unprecedented times of transformation that we live in. You don't have to look that far back in the financial markets to think about when assets were transacted in pits, when people were yelling out buy, sell, and using complicated hand gestures to transact with one another. Now, of course, that's done with computers. Um, you think you can just click a button, trade a stock, trade a bond, it's fairly easy, but behind that still sits a fragmented infrastructure within financial markets. The possibilities that we see with digital assets seek to absolutely transform that landscape in terms of efficiency, information flow, and completely change the underlying infrastructure. As such, we think we're uniquely positioned to play a meaningful role in that going forward. It all started with Bitcoin. It got people talking, it got people thinking, and it was truly revolutionary. The Bitcoin concept paper was published in 2008, and the author still remains mysteriously anonymous to this day. The first Bitcoin was created in January 2009, and Bitcoin's created by mining, that is using computer power to solve equations to validate transactions on the blockchain. It's a unique asset. It has properties, for example, if you lose your private key, you could lose your Bitcoin. So there are some major advantages, but it comes with some new challenges that we can help people navigate. Now, what's critically unique and important about Bitcoin is that it has finite supply. There can only ever be 21 million Bitcoin in existence. As of today, there's around 18 and a half million in existence. And as of today, the market cap of Bitcoin is pushing up towards around $300 billion with Bitcoin trading above $13,000. Now, this is critically important. How are the dichotomy that exists between traditional fiat money and exists between Bitcoin. Fiat money is printed by governments, it's backed by governments, and it has centralized control. There's, of course, possible to do physical transactions with cash as well as digital transactions, but digital transactions occur via a network of authorized third parties. Digital transactions also come with fees. And the most important point that I'm going to keep reiterating is that fiat currency has unlimited supply. Governments can and do print more money. In contrast with Bitcoin, it's generated algorithmically. It's not backed by any authority. It operates via a decentralized network around the globe. It conducts only digital transactions. It's digitally native in contrast with traditional money. And money is transferred via peer-to-peer -peer direct transactions, not with networks of intermediaries. So it's incredibly fast, incredibly efficient and cheap. It often free transactions and there is very limited supply as this chart shows. So here the pink line represents the amount of money creation that's happening in the M2 money stock in the US. Now we all know about the COVID pandemic and the havoc that that's wreaked on the global economy. One way governments have fought back is through by a monetary stimulus. They print more money. That's great for short-term recovery. But of course, as you increase supply, it becomes less scarce, less valuable, and you have inflation problems. In contrast with Bitcoin, the dark blue line, you can see that the supply of new Bitcoin coming into existence is rapidly decreasing and it's becoming ever more scarce. Like it or not, Bitcoin is here to stay. It survived the requisite crises to prove that it can weather the storm that financial assets must survive through. It's had extremely meteoric rises. It's come back down to earth. It's volatile. It's now existed for a considerable period and I think has matured as an asset class by demonstrating that it can weather those storms. And in fact, it's gone well beyond that. And Bitcoin is now regarded as an asset class in its own right that can help to diversify traditional portfolios by virtue of the fact that it has lower correlations with other asset classes. Now, other people, of course, wanted to join, jump on the bandwagon. This was too exciting, it was too interesting, and it was too profitable. So then came the whole industry of alternate coins. I was doing some research the other day, and I was astounded to find out that there's around two and a half to 3,000 different alternative coins floating around out there that have seeked to either improve on or change some attribute of Bitcoin. Now, they can be mining-based, which means they're rewarded for solving complex computer problems and unlocking new blocks. They could be stable coins, which are digital representations of dollars, euros, gold, et cetera, so they're digitally native and can trade within this ecosystem more efficiently. There's a lot of security tokens. Security tokens in the press might be referred to as initial coin offerings. 
So for a company to raise funding, instead of issuing a stock or issuing a bond, they might issue an initial coin offering to raise funding. And of course, there's a lot of utility tokens, meaning people exchange fiat money for a utility token that can unlock value and be used to make purchases on a platform. There's a few logos over there on the right that people might recognize. They're probably familiar with Libra. This is a relatively high profile one. And of course, is Facebook's intent and plan uh, to build a digital currency, much like Amazon also has a coin where you can use the Amazon coin to purchase computer games and other things on Amazon. Now, not to be left behind, central banks were wondering, hey, are people going to still need our money in the future? Or is this digital version of currency going to prove so popular that we're going to get left behind? To combat that, they could either regulate it out of existence, they could forbid it, or they could recognize that the transformative underlying technology could revolutionize the financial markets. It's too exciting to ignore. So they're better off playing a proactive role, actively regulating and stabilizing the market and being involved. The Chinese government, for example, has issued some digital yuan in its market to do a pilot study. The Swiss central bank is very proactive at recognizing the unique benefits of blockchain and creating a digital currency. And the Bank of England has established a working group, and it's been a pleasure to, to sit on some of those and share ideas on how there could be a digital pound, a digital central bank currency that could move efficiently around the world and is inherently digitally native and overcome some of the present inefficiencies in the fragmented financial markets. But it doesn't stop there. We went beyond the digital coins. Tokenization is possibly the greatest opportunity within the whole digital asset sphere. I was reading a great study the other day about how over $500 trillion worth of assets are set to become digitized in the coming decade or two. Um, now, this means that as we know it today, stocks, bonds, commodity futures, REITs, ETFs, basically every packaged security wrapper has some inherent flaws and in, in, in inefficiencies. And there's a potential to create a digitally native version of those assets to massively improve operational efficiency, divisibility and scalability, transparency, so that instead of having a stock or a note and having lots of underlying documentation and information, a digitally native asset could embed that information in the blockchain and have greater transparency into its, into its authenticity. And the same for security. The authenticated ownership of an asset could be embedded within inside the digital asset itself. So it's truly revolutionary. Now, who's been the quickest to get on board? It's retail. Um, as with new opportunities in life, new fashions, new opportunities, new experiences, retail get involved fast. Institutions, by contrast, have legacy systems that need to be adapted. They need to work with regulators. They need to ensure greater stability and greater and longer periods of testing new systems. Retail, by contrast, get involved very fast, and that's what has been seen with digital assets. There's approximately 35 to 70 million users worldwide, and we're just getting started. The industry is set for huge growth. Approximately 90% of Bitcoin is currently traded by individuals. And to demonstrate perhaps how much of that is millennial in nature, tapping into that very exciting demographic, Bitcoin, as you've probably noticed, receives around 30,000 social media posts per day. So why are they so excited? Speculation, it's a volatile asset, it's an opportunity to make money. There's transaction flows occurring in Bitcoin. Um, in certain countries, it's used very heavily for emittance. It's increasingly being seen as a safe haven asset to rival traditional safe haven assets and improve upon them in a number of ways. And increasingly, there's people looking at it as a long-term investment. There's a large number of media articles speculating where Bitcoin could be trading in three years, five years, 10 years, and people are very excited about jumping on that wave. Exploring briefly the emerging markets demographic, because it's so exciting. I mean, most people think emerging market GDP is set for significant growth in the future, whilst developed markets continue to languish with, with struggling for growth. It's interesting to see the penetration rates of cryptocurrency trading into emerging markets compared to developed. In emerging markets like Nigeria, Vietnam, South Africa, digital currencies are heavily used for remittance because their native currencies come with very high transaction costs and can be quite slow to transfer. In other countries like Turkey, if you've been watching, the Turkish lira recently hit an all-time low. They're very concerned about inflation and instability. And Bitcoin trading in Turkey has recently hit an all-time high. 
So while citizens of Turkey might in the past have looked to gold or other forms of safe haven, we see increasingly that Bitcoin is replacing those as a preferred and liquid and accessible store of value. Now, I found this incredibly interesting when I started to get a lot more involved in digital assets. There's over 800 crypto native hedge funds in existence that have popped up over the last few years, excited about the trading opportunities that exist in this asset class. Their key talent comes from traditional hedge funds, people that are moving over looking for new opportunities, as well as highly quantitative millennials. The main investors into the segment today are family offices and ultra high net wealth individuals. We haven't yet seen established pension funds and insurance companies come in for investment, but I think it's only a matter of time and that will absolutely transform the amount of money tracking this asset class. Um, in fact, total AUM has generally been doubling each year. In 2018, it was around a billion dollars. In 2019, it was around $2 billion. And according to some forecasts, by the end of this year, it's gonna be around three to $4 billion. Thankfully, returns across the asset class have actually been very healthy. In 2019, the, the, the crypto hedge funds had a median return of around 30%, according to a fantastic study done by PwC and Elwood. Um, and thankfully, we've seen similar results. We, we manage a crypto fund of hedge funds, which is showing great momentum and has had five out of six positive monthly returns recently. Client demographics, traditional hedge funds. Well, comparing the size of the assets, traditional hedge fund managed around $3 trillion. So if just 1% of those assets found their way through to digital cryptocurrencies, we'd be looking at a tenfold increase in the AUM of crypto hedge funds actively involved in this space. They have, however, been slow to move. It's a new asset class and it comes with some trading challenges and nuances that don't exist uh, presently with other asset classes, but they're lured by the liquidity, by the volatility, by the correlation, and they see remaining alpha opportunities. The stock market is incredibly efficient. For decades, it's been mined by thousands of hedge funds with supercomputers, and a lot of people argue that there's much more remaining alpha in the crypto sphere than there is in trading equities, trading rates, trading bonds, etc. Now, to pick a few prominent examples, arguably the world's most respected hedge fund, Renaissance's Medallion Fund, has moved into crypto trading. Interestingly, they've chosen to do it with a CME futures contract because that's perhaps more native to the way their systems operate. It's an established exchange. It uses their existing processes and systems, and they haven't opted to do it at this stage via a crypto exchange, which might involve making some changes on their side, notwithstanding the fact that they could probably access greater liquidity and various other features that you could get with a crypto exchange. Um, Paul Tudor Jones, another legendary hedge fund manager, Great quote of his, the best profit maximizing strategy is to own the fastest horse. If I'm forced to forecast, my bet is it will be Bitcoin. He's actually gone as far as saying 2% of his wealth is invested in Bitcoin. He believes in it so profoundly. And one more quote, Stanley Druckenmiller, again, famous hedge fund manager. Frankly, if the gold bet works, the Bitcoin bet will probably work better. There's more and more people saying Bitcoin is a competitive safe haven value asset to be considered. Financial institutions are moving in this direction as my very colorful bottom right panel shows. Every financial institution you come across has a working group studying how blockchain can make their business more efficient, can improve customer experience and can increase profitability. Traditional banks have been slow to move into this sector. As I mentioned before, they need to update their systems. They need to work with their regulators and there's implications for making all those different changes but the most proactive ones will start to see very significant benefits. Up in the top right, there's a panel that says HSBC is shifting $20 billion worth of assets onto a new blockchain-based custody platform. They're doing this for efficiency, they're doing this for security, and they're doing it because they recognize that is the future evolution of the industry, and I guess they wanna be a leader. The ASX, the Australian Stock Exchange, had similar thoughts. They were very quick to develop blockchain-based settlement solutions to speed up back office infrastructure, However, as this article points out, there's some delays and it takes a while for big organizations to reconfigure their business processes to move in that direction. Investment banks are incredibly excited about it. There's a number of top banks that are together creating a digital coin to facilitate rapid and secure payments between themselves to remove settlement delays and increase efficiencies. JP Morgan's created a blockchain unit and exploring all sorts of projects. Citigroup and Goldman Sachs have gone as far as conducting the first equity swap on a blockchain, and I bet there's gonna be a lot more of those to come. Equity swaps are huge business. 
but they often involve lots of underlying documentation that needs to be stored somewhere, et cetera, et cetera. And there is huge efficiency gains and rapid improvements to be had by transacting these assets in a digital format. And Bank of America very proudly has filed 50 blockchain related patents as they seek to be a leader in this up and coming business. Now, this is a rather complex slide that despite what you think about trading a stock where you think you can just click a button, hit buy, hit sell, and it all takes care of itself, actually sitting underneath that, there's a very complex and fragmented system of lots of different agencies, transaction providers working together to move the stock around, settle cash, custody the cash. And this can be thoroughly streamlined as stock trading becomes increasingly digital. The digital asset ecosystem as it stands today is very fragmented. On the left panel, I was astonished to learn that there's around 300 cryptocurrency trading exchanges in existence. And now they obviously range from the good to the bad and to the, to the everything in between, but it's an industry that needs some amount of consolidation and needs a truly institutional grade solution to step through the pack and create trust. Same sort of story with a fragmented custody market. There's a lot of participants offering various forms and different, different twists and turns on digital asset custody, but there's a great opportunity for a leader to emerge with an institutional great solution that the market is crying out for. To reinforce that point, it's all too often when you open up the newspaper and read something about crypto that there might be a negative story under it. You know, there, there is a history of hacks. There's a history of exchanges and custody providers under investing in security. And that's led to some uh, negative consequences. Similarly, people rush towards making fast money and perhaps uh, regulatory breaches and other things on the way um, we see too often in the media. And I suggest that the ultimate leader in this business is going to be somebody who takes regulation seriously and values sustainable returns in the long run. Now, I'm just about to wrap up. This is my penultimate slide. The ecosystem and evolution and opportunities. This industry is moving fast. It's incredibly exciting. Smart contracts and token creation, I talked a bit about. Token creation is truly transformative, truly disruptive. It's the future of financial markets, in my opinion. And that brings a lot of new, along with it, a lot of new products and capabilities. So for example, borrowing and lending. There's not yet a mature market available to accept digital assets as collateral. That is incredibly important in a financial market ecosystem. Derivatives is a massive opportunity. I've got an article up there from the Bank of International Settlements that talks about $640 trillion worth of derivatives being traded. Now, whatever the real number is, it's so gigantic, it's hard to quantify. It might surprise people to hear that, in fact, in, in many asset classes, the value of derivatives trading is actually eclipsing the value of the underlying asset trading because people use it from macroeconomic perspectives to get more liquidity, to tilt their portfolio, to risk manage, et cetera. There's a large number of reasons, but derivatives markets are massive. And yet, in the cryptocurrency trading world, it's nascent, if anything. There's a huge scope for a leader to design the architecture of how derivatives are going to operate and build out that business model. Evolving from derivatives, the next step is bespoke solutions or structured products, as we call them inside investment banks. They're tailored derivatives to meet specific investment goals or risk management goals that high net wealth clients or institutions have. That's not even scratching the surface yet in crypto, despite the fact that I know from firsthand experience, there is a massive opportunity in that aspect of the business. Trading and custody, I talked a little bit about, there needs to be consolidation and there needs to be a consistent regulatory framework to enable the industry to grow, but that's very much where we're heading. Two more news articles quickly. 40 banks have approached the German regulator Buff in expressing an interest in getting into digital assets, right? So in Germany, the regulators come out and said, we recognize that digital assets are gonna play an increasingly important role. If you wanna participate in that, you need to get licensed by us. All the banks quickly rushed along and said, we need something in this space, we need to get involved. And I compliment the European Union in this regard. They've actually recognized that digital assets represents a huge technological growth opportunity. So they've sought to get involved, create a consistent regulatory environment and help achieve successful and healthy growth in that part of the market. Just to finish on one quote, which I think really emphasizes the times they are changing as, a, as of course, Bob Dylan said, you don't have to think back more than a couple of years when Jamie Dimon, you know, the incredibly well-respected CEO of JP Morgan said, 
if any of our traders are stupid enough to trade Bitcoin, they probably deserve to get fired. And it's fair to say he was initially quite skeptical on Bitcoin, although he and others recognized that there were some fantastic technological advancements that came along with blockchain. I think this is really a sign of the times. There was a JP Morgan research note that came out in the past week and basically says they actually expect the price of Bitcoin to potentially triple over the years ahead and to challenge gold as a safe haven asset. So I think this world is new to all of us. Um, people have started out understandably as being skeptical, but I suggest the underlying technological advancements are just far too profound to ignore. I suggest that Bitcoin has stood a test of time uh, and we'll see increasing mainstream adoption from hedge funds, from institutions. And we are right now at the cusp of a landmark opportunity in finance where the financial markets are going to be absolutely revolutionized in the years ahead.